Hello, travelers, and welcome to Reach the World's Explorer program. For over 20 years, Reach the World has inspired youth to become curious, confident, and compassionate global citizens using virtual exchange. My name is Tim, and I'm so glad you're joining us for today's live stream event. I hope you're ready for a real adventure today. I could hardly sleep last night. I was so excited for this conversation. You are about to meet filmmaker maker, and explorer Tom Pollard, who's going to share with us today his amazing experiences on and around Mount Everest. We're also uh, going to be making some of our first connections with some of the famous British expeditions to Mount Everest in the 1920s, which is a topic we'll look into with some more detail uh, in the coming weeks. And as a reminder, this is the second live stream event for Reach the World's Expedition to Everest Virtual Exchange. If you are a K through 12 educator who would like to follow this entire virtual exchange live with your students, I'm gonna add the free registration link below in just a minute. But before I do that, it is time for us to travel virtually again to the Himalayas. Tom, welcome to Reach the World. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Tim. I appreciate it and to anyone who is watching, Greetings, and thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to my presentation. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. Where are you joining us from today, Tom? I am in Bartlett, New Hampshire, in the heart of the White Mountains, a beautiful place when all the leaves are turning beautiful colors right now. Fall foliage is at its just about at its peak. Oh, that sounds so nice. Um, I am ready for you to dive into your presentation. Um, I'm gonna bring up some of these beautiful photos that you have, and when you're ready, please feel free to take it away. All right. All right, well, everybody, I typically start my presentation with something that isn't as much about exploration, but it is about our own life and the passions and the things that we believe in and the things that we know is are true in our heart. And so um, this is not a Shakespeare class, but here is a quote from a Shakespeare play. And in it, Hamlet says, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophy, which essentially means that if you can dream it and believe it, it, it is out there and it's possible to attain. And I truly believe that. And when I was a young kid in, in high school and, and in grade school, I didn't really believe that, but I always had my, my goals and dreams set to faraway places. So Tim, if you could forward to the next slide. So as you can see, uh, here I am in, in China. This is only a few years ago, but I, I felt early on in my life a call to adventure. I wanted to go see things that were different. I spent a ton of time in a small little mountain behind my house where no human beings were, and there were little caves and stone walls and, and porcupines and different animals, and I'd explore back there and come home at the end of the day, and my mother would say, where on earth were you? And I would say, well, I have no idea, but I made it back, and that was a good sign. So. Uh, I just wanted to see things that were, <clears throat> were different. So if we could move on to the next. So I went to college and went to Boston University. I was on a, an athletic scholarship, but I knew that my dream was truly to create films and documentaries. And so I wanted to blend my love of climbing and mountaineering with my ability to create videos and films. Now, this is before Instagram or Facebook. Even email back then didn't exist when I started doing this. So I took a tiny little video camera like the one you see there, and I went on adventures around, mostly around North America. The one on the right is Alaska. The one on the left is North Conway, New Hampshire, and filmed little videos and put them together and Nobody could see them because there wasn't YouTube back then or anything. So if you could move forward to the next slide. And as I began making these videos, I would put them on something called VHS. It's a, it's a format of video camera uh, that doesn't really exist anymore. I still have some, but I would put these presentations on VHS cassettes and play them for people. And as people gave me positive responses, my belief 
started becoming entrenched. I thought, wow, if I can do this and make some people happy, I want to go in bigger and beautiful, more beautiful places. So I set my eyes on places like Nepal, and you can see this, this, this stupa in the background, very exotic places that were strange but curious to me, if you could move to the next slide. And, and I wanted to see animals like yaks that live above altitudes of 13,000 feet that have such thick fur, you can't even get through the fur to the skin of the animal, which you're not supposed to touch the animal anyway, because they don't they don't have any problem using those horns. So you stay clear away. But I was, I would dream about these things. And I thought, I'm gonna get there someday. And if the next slide, please. And the and the focus of that dream of mine was Mount Everest. And now we're looking at Mount Everest from China. This is the Tibet side of Mount Everest now. There's the other side as well, that's from Nepal, but we're looking south to Mount Everest. It, as many of you know, it's the highest mountain in the world. It's 29,035 feet in height, in altitude. So those students who are watching from Boulder, Colorado, you have some 14,000 foot mountains not too far from you. So this is essentially twice the elevation or the altitude. And it became almost an obsession for me to get there. I was gonna do absolutely anything that it took to get to Mount Everest. If you could move to the next slide. So in order to get there, I had to pay my dues. I had to do things that would prove that I had the ability and the, and, and the, the fortitude and the strength and, and the experience in order to be a person who could go to Mount Everest. And so I went to places like in this mountain here, this is in Pakistan on a mountain called Gashabram II. And we had many, a very, several brushes with death there. It was, a, it was an absolutely terrifying expedition. But when I came through that expedition, I realized that I was pretty darn good at what I did. And even in the worst situations, the worst storms, I always had my camera with me and I was never so afraid that I didn't get my camera out and start filming. So I was getting there, I was pretty close. So if you could go to the next slide. So as I, my mom, I mentioned her earlier, where on earth were you today, Tom? Well, she said that forever and my entire life, who, where did you come from? And Tom, who is this this little boy that used to be so happy running around in the living room and um, you know, playing in the backyard. And, and in the years that have gone since, I've been to 26 countries. My, my entire career has been built around adventures and, and filming documentaries on a dozen plus expeditions. I've lived, even though I could have made more money, I could have been paid a lot more, I could only do what was true to my heart. And I, I have always shared that with my own two children. I have two sons. Only do what's truly your passion and what you believe in. And I've been to Everest, and I'll show you some soon, four Everest expeditions that have been become documentaries. And I've had this cultural perspective. I think Mark Twain said something of like, um, the greatest antidote to, to uh, prejudice is travel. You travel and meet people that are so different. They look different and they act different and you don't understand their words, but you have to reach out and touch their hand and look them in the eye. And suddenly you realize that you're part of this beautiful world of, of people and cultures. And for me, work has always been play. I always have said I've never worked a day in my life. So if you could go to the next but it also comes with some danger, and I, I would always take risks, and I'm not saying that you should take physical risks, but in the filming that I've done, I've been attacked. Well, when I say attacked by a shark, I never was bitten by a shark, but I came really close, and you see the shark on the bottom there. I've been in two avalanches, one in Alaska and one here in New Hampshire. Um, I've survived some absolutely terrifying Himalayan storms up in the death zone. 
uh, I had to bury myself into a snow cave, and that's on the upper right of this picture. And I had a TIA, and a TIA is a trans ischemic attack. It's like a stroke where you're there, the, there's like a blood clot that, that shuts down your function and makes your whole face and body go numb. And that happened. I think I'm back to normal. You know, some people still think I'm a little bit crazy, but so next slide, please. Thank you. So one of the most important things for me, and I suggest this to everybody, no matter how old or young they are, find a mentor, somebody you believe in, Bradford Washburn. He created the Boston Museum of Science, one of the greatest science museums in the United States. Uh, and he climbed 13 first ascents in Alaska. Next slide, please. And um, Brad shared with me many of his experiences. He was a great aerial photographer and flew in airplanes and took the door off airplanes and would hang out the airplane to get these beautiful photographs. So he was my true inspiration, Brad, and he taught me a lot before he passed away about 14 or 15 years ago. Next slide, please. So the belly of the whale. So suddenly I get this opportunity to go and prove myself. I get a call from PBS, the, the public broadcasting, ANOVA, is the science documentary television program that's on. Uh, it's been on for now 30 some odd years. And they asked me to go to Mount Everest in 1999. And of course I said, yes. And next slide, please. And their, their charge is they wanted to do a scientific expedition to look for any evidence of these two men, George Mallory and Sandy Irvin from the 1924 British Everest expedition. And now it, at the time, 75 years had passed and these men had last been seen on just about 800 feet from the summit of Mount Everest, but they disappeared into a cloud and had never been seen again. But we don't know, were they the first men or human beings to climb the mountain? We were there to try to find evidence of whether they made it or not. So go next slide, please. So here's the North Face of Everest, and we are gonna look in that left, the part on the left side of the screen, if you will, of that photograph, and we are gonna fan out across that area to look using clues from previous expeditions to look for the bodies of these men. I know, kind of gross, right? But we're talking freezing there, like, like zero degrees would be warm up there. So we we're looking for their bodies. And if we could find them, maybe we could find a camera that they might have taken to the summit. Next slide, please. And here's their expedition. Almost 100 years have gone by since these two men have disappeared. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and here we are. This is the search team in 1999 and uh, some very strong climbers. So we fanned up and made our way up the mountain. Next slide, please. And on the morning of May 1st, 1999, we departed our Camp 5, which is at about 26,000 feet in elevation. It's in an area called the Death Zone. The oxygen is so thin up there that it's impossible to actually survive for a long period of time. So if you stayed up there for three or four days, you'd probably die. And that's why the guy on the right is wearing an oxygen mask because it's attached to a bottle, big bottle, maybe eight hours worth of good oxygen. And on the left of this slide, you can see some of our team members ascending upward toward the site where we believed George Mallory and Sandy Irvin would be. Next slide, please. And then in the morning, uh, Conrad Anker, one of the climbers and searchers on our team, this is Andy Politz in this photograph here, came upon the body of George Mallory at almost 27,000 feet in elevation. And I've kept this slide purposefully so you don't really see him, but he's at the very bottom of the slide. Mallory had been missing for 75 years. And when he died, he had three children, the oldest of which was only nine years old. So think about that. Those three children grew up and lived and became old people before they ever learned anything about what happened to their dad. And we found his body 
and we were able to take back home with us information about what happened to their dad. Next slide, please. Here is the boot on the foot of George Mallory. Pretty cool. They call these hobnail boots, and they're just like leather boots, like you might have work boots that you use. And But this is one of the boots that he was wearing. And as far as I know, right now, this boot will hopefully be on display at the Royal Geographical Society. I'm not sure, but this boot we brought home with us to the United States and then put it, gave it to the family and to the Royal Geographical Society. So it was a successful expedition. And uh, next slide, please. We also brought with us home with us some of the other artifacts, his, his, his goggles, pretty cool, huh? A watch that was found in his pocket. We found a letter that he had written that was with him that he carried on summit day to go toward the summit of Everest. But the one thing we didn't find was any, any truth or evidence of whether he made it or not. And to this day, we still don't know if Mallory made it, if Mallory and Irvin made it to the summit of Mount Everest, which is, so it's still a mystery. It's one of the great mysteries. We know that Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay made it in 1953, but were Mallory and Irvin the first to make it? So the mystery continues. Perhaps somebody listening right now is thinking, I'm going to go find out someday if they made it. We need to find Sandy Irvin. So next slide, please. So for me, I had not been to the summit. I had an opportunity on that 1999 expedition, but I passed. I decided to go back to the site of George Mallory and do more filming there. And went again to Everest on the south side in 2014. Did not have a shot at the summit, but the dream for me was still strong. So in 2016, 2016, I returned to film a documentary called Sharing Everest and uh, kind of appropriate of what I'm doing right now. Next slide, please. And in the, in the filming of this mountain, mountain film, I would try to make it look like, so people like you could see what it's like to climb Mount Everest. So I would set up shots that would show, oh, here's what it's like to cross a deep crevasse on a, an aluminum ladder. So I set up this ladder and had guys walk right over me. Next slide, please. And then you can see now it looks like this guy's climbing over a deep crevasse, right? And that's Jim, a friend of mine who was happy to put his crampon points right over my face for a good shot. But onward we went. So next slide, please. Um, so the cure to my fever, this, this, this call to adventure, this, this desire to stand on the highest point of the world, the only cure for it, as far as I thought, was to actually get there. Maybe this itch that I have will finally go away if I can finally stand there. Next slide, please. So upwards we go. This is on, at Camp One on Mount Everest, 19,000 feet in elevation. You can see how tiny we look, and it's colder. But during the day, in the sun, it's blinding heat. I took off my sunglasses and lay back in the sun for 10 minutes one day, and there was a burn on the side of my face that made that blistered and made me actually bleed from how hot and penetrating the sun was, the power of the sun and the elements. And then the minute the sun goes down, it's 10 below zero. It, it just the extremes are mind boggling. So everything you do is to keep safe and try to keep yourself strong for summit day. Next slide, please. So this is we. This is one of the crevasses we had to tra travel over in order to get to the base of the actual summit pyramid. So you can see this crevasse probably only goes down 50 or so feet, but you sure don't wanna fall in that, right? Next slide, please. This is a shot looking out toward Cho Oyu. It's the sixth highest mountain in the world. And it's a beautiful view from our camp at 23,000 feet on the Lhotse face of now we're still, remember, we're in Nepal right now. So next slide, please. Now this, what we're looking at is the South Coal of Mount Everest, 26,000 feet, well into the death zone. And you can see, we call this the triangular face. And our objective to get to the summit is to head straight up 
to just to the left of the, the tippity top and hit the ridge and then take a left turn, if you will, up to the summit. Now, the weather was very, very cold and not not being nice to us. So I thought there was no way we were going to even get a shot for the summit. But my friend Lakpa Sherpa, one of the strongest people I've ever climbed with, he said, tonight we leave for the summit at eight o'clock. OK, next slide, please. So upwards we go. And you can see it's getting very, very dark. On the right is Lhotse. On the left is Makalu, the fifth highest mountain in the world. Now that's over toward China right there. Getting kind of chilly, but we're at 27,000 feet, making our way upward. Next slide, please. And now we're at just below the south summit, almost 28,000 feet. It's dark, but here's the cool thing. So Lakpa said, we'll probably get to the summit at sunrise. So just take your time and relax. But I was really jazzed up. I said, move, let's go faster, faster. So he's like, you're going too fast. And I said, no, we're not going too fast. Really keep hauling. I really want to get there and relax and not have to worry about any other people. You can see those little lights on the left of that slide. That's the nearest people to us. We were way ahead of the pack. And uh, if you go up to the next slide, please, Tim. So this is the final stretch up to this area called the Hillary Step, very rocky. Each side drops down thousands and thousands of feet. If you were to literally throw a pebble 10 feet to your left or 10 feet to your right, that rock would go down thousands of feet. So there's no making any mistakes here. You have to be very, very careful. Next slide, please. These are just about the final steps to the summit. And did we go fast? Well, yeah, we were supposed to be to the, su to the summit at about 6.30 in the morning, and we got there at 2.40 in the morning. We got there four hours faster than, than we were supposed to. And Locke was like, okay. But here's the cool thing. If you go to the next slide, please, you can see how beautiful it is. We were under a brilliant full moon. And it's the full moon of May. And they call it the full Buddha moon. And in the Buddhist religion, they observe the birth of the Buddha. He would be like Jesus in the Christian religion. And the, the full Buddha moon marks the birth of the Buddha. And here we are at the absolute peak of the full moon. And everything glowed. And it was so tranquil up there. Next slide, please. Here is literally the tippity top of Mount Everest, 29,035 feet or 8,050 meters. With, you can see there's stuff on it. Those are prayer flags that people have left on the top. It's, it's a tradition. I'm not a big fan of it, but that's what it looks like on the summit. You can see the moon glowing. Well, not the moon, but the glow in the distance. And now the next shot, please. And this is a shot that Lakpa took oh, probably only 10 feet away from me of me fidgeting with my backpack. And you can see the glow of my headlamp and slightly sloping off behind me to the right and going upward is the final steps to the summit. So this is our summit photograph at 2.40 in the morning. We had the mountain to ourselves. We we're all alone. We spent probably 30 minutes up there took a bunch of photographs. And I also had the opportunity to take a little teeny capsule that had some ashes in it of my father, of my mother, and of my brother. And we dispersed them on the summit with permission. We didn't do it illegally. We asked permission for it. So how cool is that? Dispersing ashes from the summit of Mount Everest. Next photo, please. This is our walk down. The sun, the full moon rather, is just about to set below the horizon. An amazing, amazing experience. I'm so thankful that I made it. But when it all comes down to it, what's the most important thing to me? Honestly, it's not making it to the summit. It's the next slide, please. It's the friendships and the relationships that you build when you travel. And you'd never know the person sitting to your right, right this very second, or the person just to your left, you never know 
how powerful one single kind act can mean to another person. And so I learned that in my travels. Next slide, please. Lakpa on the summit, one of my dearest friends who just is such a beautiful human being, a close friend of mine. Next shot, please. This is our 2019 team to China that we went back with National Geographic to look for Sandy Irvin's body unsuccessfully, on, during which though we flew a drone, an off the shelf drone about this big, all the way to the summit of Mount Everest and took pictures of the entire North Face. So there was some successes, uh, but not finding Sandy Irvin, but truly developing deep friendships and relationships with, this is just a small part of it, but these guys right here. Next shot slide, please. And more of our Sherpa friends making their way to the summit of Mount Everest in 2019. Beautiful, beautiful people. Next slide, please. Ah, another Lakpa, a different Lakpa, and Densa on the right. Beautiful human beings who I will forever have in my heart, and I hope to see them again someday. Strong, absolute terrifyingly powerful human beings with beautiful, kind souls, always smiling and kind to you. So next slide, please. So after one summits Mount Everest, does the, does the desire to climb go away? Well, the, the, the truth is no, it never went away. I was on the summit and I thought, oh, I, nothing's gonna be different. And it's kind of true, but I was able to return to home and go back and bring these experiences and hopefully share some of those experiences with you and talk about it and use Mount Everest, not as an important thing like Everest, but as a portal, as a doorway, to open up and meet people and share with them my hardships and the losses. And I will say as this, you, I, if you want, you can go to that last slide of mine. You, the most important lessons I ever learned were in my failures and in the hardships, in the difficulties, in the things that did not go well for me. And uh, the successes, like standing on the summit of Everest, it pales in comparison to my snow caves and my avalanches and my TIA. That's where I learned the tough stuff. So when bad things happen to you, when you're thinking, my life is awful, I'm why me? This is where you learn open your eyes up and take account of what is happening to you and realize the greatest lessons are in the difficulties. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. And now I put it back to you, Tim, and want to thank you all for this opportunity to share with you my Mount Everest experiences. Oh, that was amazing, Tom. Thank you so much for sharing cool. that experience. I feel like that's the closest, without going to Everest, that's the closest we're going to get to experiencing what it's like to be on Mount Everest. Uh, we had learned last week about a lot of the risks that it, it entails you take on if you're climbing the mountain, but to see your photos and hear more stories in a different perspective on the mountain uh, it is so great. I have a hundred questions for you, but I want to bring in our friends in Boulder, uh, at the Friend School in Boulder, and welcome them. Hello, Friend School. Hi, again. <laughs> I, am, I am sure that you have questions. Would anybody like, and Miss Long can coordinate on that end, if anyone would like to come up to the camera and ask a question for Tom, please go ahead. Nola has a first question. That we Did any ask. of your friends die? <laughs> Uh, that's a, that is a question I am asked frequently. I have had people that I know who have lost their lives on the mountain, but never during one of my, not on one of my teams. I've had many people get very, very sick. Um, and yes, I know people who have died, but fortunately not during one of my trips. That's good news to hear. They yes, didn't it is. Yes. All right, Avery had, Avery had a question next. Um, can I go? What do you I think? Get in line behind Avery. What do you think happened to the person that? What do you think happened to the person that you didn't find? George Mallory. That's a great question. Um, my belief. Many many people believe that they went all the way to the summit, and then came down, and died at night, nighttime, and fell, and you know froze, right? 
my feeling is, is that they could not make it and that on their descent, meaning going back down to their camp, I think they ran out of oxygen. They got very, very tired and disoriented and fell or lay down and never moved again. So it, it's very sad. And I, when I was able to meet George Mallory's son after the 1999 expedition, and he was 79 years old. And I asked him, do you have any memories of your dad? And he said, I have one memory. When I was a little, little guy, we had a snowball fight in our yard. And that was the only memory he ever had with his father. And so I was able to bring to him how beautiful and how strong and magnificent that I felt his father was. And hopefully I brought him some sense of, of peace. That's awesome. That's really yeah. special. All right, this is Tristan. Um, why, why did that um guy say you were going too fast? Yeah, great question, Tristan. So Lakpa has been to the summit, I think, seven times now, and he knows what it's like to get up there. And he's seen people get really tired and go too fast. Are you going yeah. too fast? Slow down, relax, just save your energy. And he wasn't sure if maybe if we went too fast, I was going to peter out and lose all my energy and be too tired when we got close. But I just kept. So he, so I just kept going and going. Yeah. But so he just wanted to make sure that he was conserving my energy. But I didn't need to worry about that. Everything went fine. Thanks, buddy. It's winter. Hey, um, like hearing all those like scary stories about going to Mount Everest, was it scary or hard to go? Yeah, you know, it's such a cool question because when I'm there in the middle of it during a storm or, or when, when bad things are happening on the mountain, I'm not afraid. I'm never fearful then. The time that I feel fear the most is, as you asked, before you go, what's I afraid? Sometimes in the middle of the night, I would wake up and I'd think, what am I doing? Like, why am I doing this? What is it that makes me want to go do these crazy things? Like my mom used to say, what, who are you? Why do you do this? So those are the times that I'm afraid when I'm alone with my thoughts and I let my fears ruminate in there. But you have to put those away and, and say never mind to those and just and, and filter them out. Thank you for that question. That takes a special person to be able to put aside their fears like that. Yeah. That's impressive. Kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, buddy. All right, Lang, what do you got? Well, uh, I was wondering, uh, how many times did how many times did you try to get to the summit? Yes, I actually only had one summit opportunity. At the yes, other I three times, I didn't have a chance to go, so I had one summit opportunity and made it. And I was wondering, <clears throat> did you get to see the body of him too? Yes, I did. I, I was there. I all those. Well, I only put two pictures up there, but yes, I I took a bunch of pictures and we filmed. And it's on a documentary called Lost on Everest. And then and there was also so that's probably somewhere out there to be found. But our 2019 expedition has another Lost on Everest. They named it the same thing. Go figure. But but yes, and to see the body was really powerful. And now this is the one thing that I always say to people. Um, when you're outside of it, you think, oh, how could you do that? How could you go up and, and, and look around the site and try to find the camera? But to me, it's a very important piece of history. And George Mallory was one of the greatest explorers of the early 1900s, truly one of the, the strongest and bravest explorers who wanted to see if it was possible to climb Mount Everest. And back in 1924, Almost everybody, all the scientists said, you will definitely die if you go up there, 100%. You can't survive. And so he went up because he had a feeling in his head and in his heart that he was capable of doing it. So when I saw him for the first time, 
realize he had been there for 75 years and nobody had seen him. I actually got down and, and just sat down near him. And it, I didn't talk to him or anything, but I thought to myself, I respect you. I'm, I'm inspired by you. And everything that I'm going to do to film you is purely to bring your story home. Because that he went, he used to travel around the world telling his story about Mount Everest. And if I were able to go do what I did, I could bring his story to a wider audience. And so in finding him, it was difficult. And I looked at his face and, and his body and, and, and examined to see how he might have died. And um, I, I was just I, I'm more inspired by him than I could have ever imagined. And I think about it every single day. It was 23 years ago, 20 some odd years ago. Every day I think about him. Um, also, wh what if <clears throat> the other man got to the top but was found on the other side and they didn't believe he got to the top, but he just came up to the top and then went down the other side? Yeah. That, well, you know, you just hit on something pretty right on point. So in 1975, there was an expedition by the Chinese and it was kind of a secret for many, many years, but we learned that they actually came across the body of who we believe is Sandy Irvin. And they said that he was on the ridge. So the, the whole mountain ascends up, right, to the summit. And they said he never dropped down to where we found George Mallory on the ridge. And some years later, a team like in the early 2000s, apparently, and now this isn't to be disrespectful, it's almost respectful, but they pushed, his, pushed him over to the other east side of the mountain called the Kangsheng Face. And it drops like 8,000 feet down into crevasses and everything. So it's entirely possible that he did make it and is on the other side right now. That's a good thing. You can look at a map of it from the summit and you can see that it's kind of got three sides, like a pyramid in a way. Great question. Um, like, when you found the body, how did it look like? Like, was it stone? Could you still see his skin? Like, what did it look like? Yeah. Well, he was, it, it to me, my, the thing that I said was that it looked like he might have just died yesterday. He was perfectly preserved. And when I looked at his face, it looked like he was asleep. It just looked like he had literally just fallen asleep. But he was frozen completely because it's really, really, really cold up there. Right. Not that cold, but like imagine a freeze, your, your, the freezer at your house in the refrigerator like that. So if you put something in the ref, in the freezer, it becomes hard. And so like, um, yeah. So like he, he died because he was so cold. Well, when you are up at altitude, now I say altitude, I remember, do you remember when I was talking about the death zone? So there's this part of the mountain where you go up and the, uh, there's only about a third the amount of oxygen in the air. So imagine you're, you're sitting here talking to me breathing, but you're not even thinking about your breathing, right? It's like, the, why would you think about it? Because it's, it's easy. But when you run, you start going <gasps> breathing like that. You become aware of how much oxygen your body needs. When you go up to Mount Everest to the summit, there's one third the amount of oxygen. So what I think happened to Mallory and Irvin is that they ran out of their bottled oxygen and they, and what happens is you kind of lose it. You just kind of think that you're hot when you're cold, you kind of get a little kooky and crazy and you make really bad decisions. You might step off a cliff and not even think about it. So I think he was probably cold. Yes. But I think he was losing it, you know, had no oxygen and they call it hypoxia or altitude mountain sickness? Thank you, good question. Thank Great you. questions. Amazing. Two more questions, do you have a question? Just one um, more hi. question. Hi. So I was wondering, like, was there like any facial expressions on the dead body, on the body? Well, 
That's a really cool question because I literally feel like he seemed pe like at peace, like as if he had just fallen asleep, but he felt good, whatever that means. There was no smile or no frown, but he just seemed like you ever see somebody sleeping and they look like they're having a nice sleep. They're like, oh, you know, it kind of seemed like that. His eyes were closed. His mouth was closed. And that's that's all. You know, so so no big expression, though. But my gut is that he was, you know, he was uh, probably pretty cold when he took his last breath. Yeah. And um, one more thing. Mm -hmm. did they did you ever put the boot and like the artifacts you found in the mu museum? In a yes. Museum? Um, so all the artifacts, like the watch, we have found an altimeter, other letters, a knife. Uh, some some food, little tins of food and snacks. We brought everything home. And as far as I know, everything is either with the Royal Geographical Society or with the Mallory family. And so even the camera that we were looking for, which doesn't it, we never found, that would go to them because we don't really own it. But all those are, I think they might be, some of it might be on the display with the Royal Geographical Society. So, that was kind of fuzzy just for one second. That was such a good question. I want to remind you in a couple of weeks, we're going to be doing a virtual field trip of a new exhibition at the Royal Geographical Society in London, yes. all about filmmaking and the Mallory Irving expedition. So if they have those items, and I would have to double check, I don't know offhand, maybe those will be something that we can see as part of that virtual field trip. So stay tuned for that. Cool. That'd be cool. super cool. So um, they, yeah. Um, what was his like? Um, was was everything like torn up or like was his skin so soft? Or, like, yeah, yeah, still, it was. Believe it or not, maybe? I mean, he was frozen, but you could like there was it was just the way it was when he was alive. But the but the fabric that there's the ultraviolet light is like is the kind of stuff that gives you your sunburn it's the, the really dangerous part of sunlight it it broke apart the fabric of what he was wearing and so when you touched it you could see all little particles of the fabric and it was like falling apart when you touched it it was really interesting so the sun had weakened all the particles and all the fabric to almost you know, like it, just imagine some your favorite T-shirt that you wear that's about to fall apart. It was like that. So yeah, but but his body was in you know preserved shape. Great Thank question. You. Maybe we can do one you more are. question, Miss Long. We have one more, Pearl. Pearl didn't get to ask her question yet, so she's gonna come. <laughs> Did it? You like see what it said on the letter that was in his pockets? Yes, we did. We read letters and we have them all transcribed. One was a letter from a friend that was just wishing him well on the expedition. And um, we also found notes that he wrote, little notes that pertain to the equipment. He had to move up to one camp or down to another camp. But yeah, so we, I can, um, provide that to you but we have there's a website i'm sure somewhere where i can provide you with exactly what it says on all the letters but it was nothing like we made it to the summit you know nothing <laughs> like that unfortunately so but one cool little little piece is that he was married to a woman and her name was ruth and he had always told ruth that he was going to bring a photograph of her up the mountain and leave it on the summit when he summoned it. And when we found George Mallory, there was no photograph with him. So many people say, ooh, maybe, you know, maybe he left it at the summit. We don't know. We have to find Sandy Irvin and the camera, hopefully, to see if they made it. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Wow. Thank Great you. question. I have goosebumps from that last thing that you just said about the picture of his wife. Yeah. Um, I am, as just sort of to, to wrap all of this up, on top of all of these amazing stories that you're telling, Tom, I'm so amazed that while so many people are just trying to survive themselves on Everest, 
that you were able to not only survive yourself, but also film it, have your camera out and share those experiences with the rest of us who mm -hmm. may never get the chance to climb Mount Everest. So um, yeah. are there any, you mentioned a couple of your films. Where, where can we go to see some of your work? Well, two of them are coincidentally named the same thing, Lost on Everest, and they're 20 years apart. And those are both the searches for George Mallory and Sandy Irvin. The 1999 one, that was PBS Nova. And then the British Broadcasting Corporation did a, kind of a mirror image of that one. And then recently, the Lost on Everest from 2019 is on Disney Plus right now. And it's a National Geographic film. And also called Lost on Everest. And that shows all our drone footage and all our searches of I and what happens. It's kind of a cool film, too. Great. But, um, the other two are more like privately and they're getting parceled out in museums. But the other one uh, we did with a guy who was trying to be the hot, the oldest American to summit Mount Everest. And uh, he didn't make it. There was a big avalanche that year. And um, I'm trying to find, I can't remember the name of the film. I'll have to send it to you, Tim. We can yeah. put a link on, underneath. But it's a beautiful film done by a good friend of mine and a talented producer named Steve Orrit, okay. and he did a brilliant job with it. So I'll make sure I provide you that link so you can put it underneath here. Fantastic. Thank you, Tom, so much for joining us today and for sharing your stories. I just want to give sort of a final reminder um, that this is just the middle of our virtual exchange to Mount Everest. We've got a lot more going on. Um, I shared the link to the homepage and the registration link uh, throughout this event for anyone who's interested in joining us still. Um, over the next few weeks, we're going to talk to more scientists, explorers, other filmmakers, members of the Sherpa community. And like I previewed before, we're even going to travel to the Royal Geographical Society to see their cool new exhibition. So with that, I'm going to bring our friends at, Bol at Friend School back in so they can say... Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, that's good. Thank you.